But we're going to look at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And Matthew chapter 1 is going to be the passage we're going to kick off this sermon series in Matthew with. And that's on page 1449. 1449. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Page 1449. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram. Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon. Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz the father of Obed whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, Abijah the father of Asa, Asa the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Jehoram, Jehoram the father of Uzziah, Uzziah the father of Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Amon, Amon the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, Abiud the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim. Achim the father of Eliud, Eliud the father of Eleazar, Eleazar the father of Matthan, Matthan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. Please keep that passage open and uh, there's that little sermon outline there. Uh, That's an opportunity for you to write notes. Any questions you might want to ask me over morning tea uh, or later on during the week. But I want to start with Australian politics. It's going to be a big year in Australian politics this year, isn't it? I think we've got a state election. I think there are plans for a federal election. And Clive Palmer is making a comeback. Now, in 2018... He rebranded and renamed his political party. Do you remember his previous party? It was PUP, the Palmer United Party, which gave Ross all sorts of jokes about puppies in Parliament. Well, he's decided to call his new party the United Australia Party. Sorry, Elsie's walking up the aisle because she's got activity sheets that I did for the kids and forgot to mention. So if there's kids who want an activity sheet, thank you, Elsie. I'm glad your memory's better than mine. Now, let's go back to Clive Palmer. Uh, For those who know their Australian political history, uh, it's a shrewd move. And he didn't make this move without knowing what he was doing. You see, the original United Australia Party began in 1931. It was disbanded in 1945. And in its heyday, it was led by two men, Joseph Lyons and Robert Menzies, two of the greatest prime ministers in the history of Australia. After it was disbanded in 1945, Robert Menzies took that group and became the Liberal Party. And Palmer has now claimed on his website that in this United Australia Party, he stands in the shoes of Joseph Lyons and Robert Menzies. That's a big claim, isn't it? Palmer is a shrewd man. He knows the importance of a right heritage, doesn't he? He understands that the right heritage will give substance to all of your claims, even if you are a new political party. It will give substance to the slogans that you'll present about a new beginning and greatness. It will give legitimacy to a man like Clive Palmer. Unfortunately, the plan hasn't gone so well. The families of Lyons and Menzies have come out in the last week and publicly refused any connection with Clive Palmer and are now suing their lawyers on him. Political science pundits around the nation have laughed into their cornflakes and the papers have had a party But we know the importance of the right family tree, don't we? In many walks of life, if you've got the right family tree and the right heritage, it will give you legitimacy and substance and a reputation. In fact, the right family tree can make a person and the wrong family tree can...
can exclude a person, can't it? Today we start with a family tree. It's the family tree of Jesus. So let me pray and then we'll dive into it. Dear Father, it is so great to sit in such comfort. We've got fans and carpet. We've had breakfast. We've got morning tea and the prospect of lunch. Father, we sit with your word open in our laps with great security and assurance that we'll see the day out. And all that is because of your goodness to us. Father, you have spoken to us in words that were written many, many years ago, but they are living and active just like you. Father, we pray that this list of names will be a sharp sword that cuts to the very heart of our soul and that even this list of names can change us as we live as your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Let me set the scene for you a little. Matthew is a former tax collector. He's a Jew, someone from the nation of Israel. Uh, That nation has claimed that they are the people of the God of the Bible that God has chosen them and given them various promises. Uh, One of the promises is that they'll have a patch of dirt perched on the edge of the Mediterranean. If you're thinking modern day times, it's Newcastle to Wollongong out to the Blue Mountains. But at this point, at this point, the nation lies under the authority of Rome, the greatest military power of the world. They've been dispossessed. They're under subjugation. Uh, Their hopes of glorious independence have faded God had said, you're going to be my vehicle to change the world. And yet as they look back on their past, it is checkered. And as they look at their present, it is grim. And as they look at their future, well, who knows what will happen. Uh, Matthew's a pragmatic man. And so he's made a practical decision to throw his lot in with the occupying power. He works for Rome. Oh, He's a Jew, but he's decided to work for them collecting their taxes. Not a great decision really, is it? The Romans won't let him be a citizen and the Jews hate him. And so he lives on the margin of polite society, someone rejected by every walk of life. One day Matthew meets Jesus. We'll see that next year in Matthew 9. Uh, Perhaps I can rephrase that. Uh, One day Jesus seeks Matthew. I don't know whether he expected that to happen as he opened the coin box on that dusty day. But... As the queue came forward, Jesus appeared and said, Matthew, follow me, and Matthew did. He's writing this biography of Jesus around 50 to 60 AD and he's writing it to people just like himself, Jews and Jews who've met Jesus. Now, let's use our imagination. Imagine you're a Jew around 50 to 60 AD. You've heard of this man Jesus and the claims made about him and you're holding on to those promises about your nation and Everything has been dimmed like for Matthew with how bleak the landscape looks. Why would you bother with a bloke the Romans killed? Or imagine you're a Jew who has met Jesus and decided to become a Christian. You've been moved to the margins of polite society now, haven't you? Your family's rejected you. Your community looks at you and says, what does he have that we don't? Why is what he said better than the promises we've had for centuries? So Matthew writes in that context to people like that. And this is the title of his book. I'm at point one on the outline. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That grabbed you, didn't it? It's a strange title, isn't it? But if we keep our imagination working, that's a title that grabs the original recipients because it's a title full of titles. Uh, Literally, this is the book of the new beginnings. Uh, Matthew has explicitly chosen words from the book of Genesis. Genesis 2 verse 1, uh, Genesis 2 verse 4 and Genesis 5 verse 1. This is the book of the new beginnings of the world, Genesis 2 verse 4. This is the book of the new beginnings of Adam, Genesis 5. And Matthew uses those words to say that this bloke whom you are about to meet stands in that pedigree. And then he gives him three titles. Did you see them there? Uh, Look there in verse 1. The first is, this Jesus is Christ. Put simply, he's the one that God promised would save the world. Uh, If you're in the Marvel comic universe, this is the superhero above all superheroes. They haven't even written a comic about him yet. Uh, The next title is there, this Jesus is the son of David. 
Put simply, he's connected to those promises we read about in 2 Samuel 7, made to a bloke called David who was a king back in the day that God would use that family line and a son of David to actually rule the world God designed. In fact, that king would be called the son of God. And the third title, it's there. This Jesus is the son of Abraham. He's connected with that bloke in Genesis 12. That man called Abram who became Abraham to whom God made this significant promise that through your family I will reverse the brokenness of all creation, the brokenness of every single human heart. That all seems pretty strange in a drought-stricken town in dusty New South Wales, doesn't it? I mean, I just want rain. But imagine, imagine, imagine that you are a Jew or a Jew who has followed Jesus and you hear about this bloke and these titles sit around him. Imagine that as you think about this bloke and you look out over a landscape that is dim and dark and dusty, this bloke might actually transform not only your nation but the existence of the world. As you look out at a damaged nation, a people oppressed, a landscape that is withered, at dreams and hopes that have turned to dust, surely, just surely, your hopes might start to rise. I mean, after all, this book is it going to be about the bloke who deals with everything that God has promised to the universe. And Matthew is saying, meet this man. Now, if you go a bit further, are we any different to those people? I mean, we look out at our landscape and we want things to be set right, don't we? We reflect on a a land of broken dreams, perhaps a life of broken relationships, perhaps an existence where hopes have been dashed and our desires have never been met. Don't at those points we yearn for a saviour who will reach in and not offer us a box of band-aids but grab our heart? We're facing a year of promises, aren't we? That's what elections bring. We're facing a year where we will deeply desire for the promises to be faithful and consistent. For the solutions not to reach into our hip pocket but to reach into our heart and actually say to us, there is a solution for your brokenness. Let me introduce you to Jesus. Jesus. Now, before I get ahead of myself, I I suspect you might be a little like me. They're great promises, aren't they? I I suspect several times this year you're going to say, they're great promises, but show me the dirt they're rooted in. You see, promises are great when we can actually see some substance, aren't they? And that's why we have this list of names. That's why we have this list of names. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, The reason these names are here is that they show the historical roots in the dirt of history of the promises made about this man. Uh, If you like, they're a biological, genealogical roadmap of the history of God's people, the way God has dealt with his people and the universe through 42 named generations. Uh, These are the roots, these names, that actually give substance to the titles attached to Jesus. Just look at that list with me. Uh, There in verse 2 is Abraham, the father of the nation, not just the father of Isaac. Uh, There's Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the three men who gave birth to this nation. Uh, There are the 12 tribes in verse 2, his brothers led by Judah, the line out of which the kings will come. And that promise runs through there until we get to verse 6. And who do we meet in verse 6? Just so you don't miss him. He's called the king, David. And if you know your history, that's the high point of the nation, isn't it? We're told in the Bible that under David and Solomon they had rest. But you know what often comes after high points? There's a stumbling, there's a failure, there's a spending of the capital. And so you spiral down through a list of names we'll come to and verse 11 you see that God's people leave that little patch of dirt under judgment because they didn't trust that God would do what he said. And they stayed in exile and then they came back under the glimmer of hope and as they came back we come to the present day and we meet a man called Joseph and a lady called Mary. It's really a, a map of the history of the people of God through a list of names, isn't it? The beginning, 
the promise, the high point, the low point, the restoration, and you sit now under subjugation and oppression. But really, the 42 generations aren't the important thing, are they? It's the promises that hold those 42 generations together so they can be put down on a page. The promise that through this mob, the mob of Abraham, God would reverse the curse of the world, that through this line, the line of David, that there would be a king who would rule in a way that no other king has done but we desperately need. And when those two come together, you've got the saviour of the universe. You see, the thing that stands behind this list of 42 generations and even the ones that are missed is that the promises of God are remarkably consistent, aren't they? The promises of God are remarkably consistent. They're not hollow but real. They're not tenuous, they're solid. They're not a stretch of the imagination but they're deeply true and reliable. In fact, if you want to check it out, go and look at the birth records at the synagogue because you can trace this bloke and behind it lies the consistent promise of God. There's something a little edgy about this genealogy though. I don't know if you picked it up, point three of the outline. Yeah, if you like, this is a family tree that casts a dark shadow at points. There's a bit of sharpness here, perhaps a level of undesirability. I mean, it starts just in that list of kings from David. We've got the great ones, David and Josiah, we know them. They're the people whose portraits we leave up. We've got the fallen ones, they're the ones whose portraits are a little dusty. That's Solomon and, and Hezekiah. They're the ones who've done so well and stumbled. Then we've got the downright evil ones. Ahaz, who worshipped other gods and sacrificed people and killed his own boy. Rehoboam and Jeconiah, who followed in the same footsteps. Manasseh, well, the Bible describes him as worse than that. Now, you want to create a family tree for the greatest king of the universe who's thoroughly perfect. Surely you include those names and there's a bit of a stain on the crown and the mantle, isn't there? But there are some other names there. Did you, did you get them? There are the names that start very early on. You've got Tamar in verse 3 and then you go down to verse 5 and you've got Rahab and Ruth and uh, then you go further into verse 6. You've got uh, the woman who we shan't name and whose mother had been Uriah's wife whom we know as Bathsheba. They're all women. Now, that sounds offensive for me to say in the Me Too generation. And their presence in genealogies is not unheard of, but it is remarkably unusual in such a way. And all those women are foreigners. They're not of the biological, pure bloodline. And all those women have a poor public reputation. Uh, let me just take you through them. Uh, note down the references so you can check that what I've said is true. Uh, Genesis 38, Tamar poses and lives as a prostitute in order to entrap her father-in-law who's avoided his God-given and legal responsibilities. You go through to Joshua 2 and you've got Rahab who's a prostitute in Jericho who hides the spies sent by God's people. A Ruth's not a prostitute, but she's a forward and forthright woman from the nation of Moab, and Moab is the red light district nation of the world at that time. God says, have nothing to do with that nation of loose morality. And Uriah's wife Bathsheba, she's the victim of the greatest abuse of public power in the history of the Bible, where a man who had everything took the most precious thing of another man and abused his influence. Now, on those three levels, women, foreigners, dodgy reputation, if they came up on Ancestry.com, you'd press delete, wouldn't you? Because if you're putting together the perfect family tree for the perfect saviour of the world, would you include those kings and would you include those women? And we haven't even got started on the mother. A pregnant teenage fiancé. So why would Matthew put them in? Well, I want us to just rewind a little and think a little about these women. Now, when you go back this week and read those accounts, you'll find that at points they are women who seek refuge in God and his design, all in different ways, all for different reasons, 
But the description in Ruth is remarkable because Ruth sought refuge under the protection of the wings of God. That's the same for all these women. They know who they are. They know that as sinners and foreigners, their only hope is to throw themselves upon the mercy of God. And what does God do each time? Does he delete them from the family tree of his boy? No, he welcomes them. He extends to them a mercy that they didn't deserve. He greets them and works in them and includes them and restores each one. You see, in each of these women who stand beside men who are exactly the same, did you hear me say that? In each of these women who stand beside men exactly the same, we are given a sinful human being, like you and like me. A person who says in their attitude and action, God is not and I am God. And God deals with sinners. In each of these women, we have a display publicly of the unmerited kindness, love and mercy that God extends to sinners throwing themselves upon his mercy. Restoration, forgiveness, reconciliation. God deals with sinners in mercy. That's why these women are there. So not only do we see the remarkably consistent promise of God, we see the remarkably consistent method of God. The method that says, I am faithful in my mercy to all sinners, no matter their nation. That's the substance of the promise of God. So as this biography kicks off, and we're nearly at the last point, we're confronted by the consistent promise of God and the consistent method of God. The promise of God to deal with the world broken by sin through a saving king in a certain family. And the method of God which is, I meet sinners in my mercy which they don't deserve. Now for a Jew back in those days, remember that Jew we imagined way back there at the start? Uh, This is a remedial bucket of theological cold water. Wake up. Because God deals with all people. Did you hear me say that? God deals with all people in grace. And for a Jew who's decided to follow Jesus like Matthew, this is a big, warm hug. Welcome into the family. Now, Clive Palmer didn't do so well claiming a certain heritage, did he? It's blown up. It's backfired. I don't think the same can be said for Matthew with Jesus, can it? You see, as Matthew introduces us to Jesus in this opening verse, he firmly places Jesus within a historically verifiable family tree. You can trace the promises of God in these names and those promises stand. Just look at this tree, the branches and the roots. God is consistent in what he says and does. Is is that the God we think about? Is that the God we follow? Is that the Jesus we understand? Well, Matthew introduces us to Jesus not only within the promise of God but also the method of God. God is the God who reaches out to sinners with grace. God is the God who reaches out to sinners with grace. Read through that family tree again and again and you'll grasp his grace which is available to every human being regardless of their gender or race, regardless of their history or family, regardless of their employment or education. That's the method of God. That's the God who goes into a garden to find people hiding behind fig leaves. That's the God who chooses a foreign idolater and says, you're the starting point of my mob. That's the God who deals with a king who abuses his power in corruption and murder and seduction and says, from your line will be the greatest king of all. That's the God who takes a teenage fiancé and says, through you I'll give birth to my son. Is that the method we know? 
the method of grace to sinners from God? You see, and I'll only speak for myself, it's my first Sunday, so I better do that. This introduction to Jesus reassures me. It reassures me of how consistent God is. It reassures me that a man with my family tree can come and benefit from Jesus. It reassures me that God decides that this is the family tree for his own boy. And it gently rebukes me of thinking God is anything else but consistent in his methods, generous in his promises and welcoming of people through Jesus. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Uh, A list of names written thousands of years ago are actually a statement of your consistent promises and your consistent mercy. Who would have thought it? Who else would have designed such a family tree for the saviour of the universe? Who else would have started off a book with a list of names? Who else would offer a biography that begins in such a way and ends in new beginnings? Father, that's what you've done in Matthew Thank you that you do what you say and you extend mercy to people like me. Father, help me to know you as you are and to display the method that you've shown in my life. In Jesus' name, amen.